here is a species of fern that I have yet to show on the channel, and I'm glad that I can add it to the Plethodon Party series. But this here is known as a cliff break, and that's because it's usually found on limestone cliffs, such as this one. But they have a very kind of a cactus succulent look to them, and they're pretty neat, but they only grow in, like I said, the limestone, so the very specific habitat type of this cliff. Here we have the cave salamander, or Euricea lucifuga. This is a very pretty species. It's like a orangish red, and they live inside these limestone caves that you can find in Southwest Virginia, North Carolina, Tennessee, and West Virginia. They're very slow moving. You hot dog. Yeah, it's pretty hot. So Ron and I are back together again. He couldn't come to the Deep Creek Lake vacation with the family, but that's okay. He was in good hands at the boarding place that I took him to. But now he's probably gonna go uh, on most of the trips that I film with me, so you'll be seeing a lot more of him. And we just got to see some really cool footage of that cave salamander, or Euricea lucifuga at the cave and it's the same cave that I went to in Plethodon Party and Appalachian Adventure. If you haven't seen that video yet, you should check it out. I saw the cave salamander, but that video I didn't show the cliff break, so I was excited to include that in this one. And next we're headed to a waterfall hike, so I'll meet up with y'all once we get there. While me and Roan are on our way to the Cascades Waterfall near Pembroke, Virginia, I'm going to throw up some footage that I have of a longtail salamander, which is known as Euricea longicata, and it's very closely related to the cave salamander Euricea lucifuga that we just saw, and uh, that'll just give you all a little bit of a comparison of the two. So here we have Euricea longicata, or the long-tailed salamander. This here is just a small juvenile, but this species is very easy to identify because of the black markings that it has all the way up and down its body and the very long tail that they possess. And this individual really does not like the light being given off by my camera right now, but it looks like I'm able to get a little bit of a video. and. They are very beautiful. They have this bright orange color, very signature shaped head there. And uh, they really like to hang around graveled surfaces or rocks more than logs and stuff that you would find other species of salamanders like in the Plethodon genus. One, it's a $3 charge and you have exactly $3. trail on our way to the Cascade Falls waterfall near Pembroke, Virginia. Now it's a pretty good hike. It's not too difficult ele elevation wise or anything because you're basically just following the river until you get to the waterfall and I think it's going to be pretty neat to see. Um, I get my hair wet. It's kind of hot and uh, sticky out so it's going to be refreshing. And then afterwards uh, we're going to be heading to our camp spot. Now, as for the rest of the trip, the final, or not final, but furthest destination from my home near Baltimore is Okefenokee Swamp in Georgia. 
On the way there tomorrow, we're going to be stopping in Asheville for some good local eats. Then we're going to be heading with my buddy Chris to the Nantahala National Forest near Franklin, North Carolina. And there we're going to be in search of Plethodon shermani or the red-legged salamander, similar to Plethodon jordani, the red-cheeked salamander that we saw in Plethodon Party Appalachian Adventure. Now, after we get to the Georgia Swamp, I plan on heading to Congaree, South Carolina, which is like the least visited national park in the US. And it's really awesome. There's a lot of old growth forests there and a few species of the largest tree in the world for that species. And I'll point out as many of those as I can once we get there. And there, I hope to see Eurycia guda lineata or the three-line salamander. And also perhaps we'll run into an Atlantic coast slimy salamander. Uh, which are pretty neat. They got some white patterning on the sides. So I'm hoping that we see those two species there. And then after that, I'm not entirely sure where I'm gonna be going yet, but it's gonna be somewhere in Southwest Virginia again. Well, I'm definitely glad that I kept walking past that first small waterfall that I showed because I thought that might have been it, but there was still a little bit more trail to go. So I kept walking and then I got to the ginormous waterfall that I just saw. And uh, I'm, I'm just really glad that I kept walking because I would have missed it. Brownie boy. What's up, dude? Are you hyped to go to the hike tonight and then camp out again? You're not giving me anything, buddy. Kind of hard to read there. and I are currently right here at the Pond Swamp Branch Shelter on the Appalachian Trail in Southwest Virginia. Here he is hanging out. And I got the Eno set up how I normally do. Thrown underneath. What's up, buddy? And we're just gonna be staying here tonight. And then I'll meet up with you all in the morning.
Good morning. It is Tuesday and it's the second day of the trip. Ron and I are headed back to the car so that we can get headed down to Asheville so we can get some Biscuit Head, which is a really delicious biscuit place in Asheville. And we're gonna meet up with my buddy Chris. And then once we do both of those things, we're gonna head south down to the Nantahala National Forest near Franklin, North Carolina. Here we have a beach fern, and this fern has a pretty peculiar shape, and it's pretty signature to this species. You can see at the base, the two pinnae kind of face outward and down, and the whole shape of the plant tapers from the tip to the base, and it makes a very triangular shaped frond. Here we have what I believe to be a hybrid between Plethodon teyalahi and Plethodon shermani. And the reason that I'm saying this is probably a hybrid is because Plethodon teyalahi is a dark navyish color, similar to what is the main color on this salamander. And Plethodon shermani is a gray color similar to that. And they also have red legs and this salamander seems to have a little bit of red pigment on the on the legs, as you can see. But it's not a crazy red like you would see on a true Plethodon Shermani. So I'm going to let this guy head back where it was hiding under its log and keep looking at a higher elevation for Plethodon Shermani. This here is the species of Desmognathus that imitates the red-legged salamander because the red-legged salamander is toxic. And you can see that this species of Desmognathus exhibits red or orangish colored legs, just like the Plethodon salamander that it imitates, even though this is in a completely separate genus. And the idea is that this salamander is a little bit more safe because it imitates a toxic species. I flipped some other sort of Desmognathus under a log and it's got a really neat pattern on the back. I just figured I would show it and I'll put whatever species I figure out it is once I properly ID it back at the car. This here is a southern two-line salamander or Euricea surigera. And the way that you can differentiate this between a northern two-line is first of all by location. And right now I'm in the Nantahala National Forest, so I'm in the southern two-line salamander's range. And also because the black lines on the southern two-line salamander normally go all the way to the tip of the tail, as you can see in this one. And the northern two-line, they do not go all the way to the tip of the tail. Now, I'm not much of a fun guy person, but my buddy Chris is, and he informed me that this is called a dog stinkhorn fungus and the reason for that is that these fungi are smelly so hence the name stinkhorn uh, i should probably throw a bear bag too i'm not one of those people that's gonna like be anal about it yeah but, but I, I mean I, I prefer to have one yeah where do you think would be a good uh there's not really that many. It's things. not the greatest trees around. I wish it was one of those sh shelters that has a 
Oh yeah, this is your first AT shelter. Yeah. Like other ones have like bear poles. Oh, do they? That have like a rod. Oh, nice. And then you stick your bear bag to the end of the rod and then put it up really high on this like pole with hooks on it. It's luxury. It then or like luxury. they'll have a bear box. Right. Which is a like a cabinet that a bear can't get into. I mean, honestly, that might fit in there. We could try it at the very least. Yeah, it's just sketchy to me. To not have it? Yeah. Another thing that I do when I can't find like a big bear tree is like, yeah. I just hide it in like a really crappy spot that the bear can't get to, like just all hey. in Oh, like, that's gonna be cool on the video. He just went right up to the camera. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So like, you could like try and like finagle it into that like really overgrown like yeah wooded area that's like all falling down. Yeah. I've had a bear come up to my tent before. I'm not afraid. <laughs> <laughs> I just remember that uh, that video that you sh that you, or the the oh the grizzly bear. Dude, that was so. <laughs> that's bad. a grizzly bear though. I don't care. <laughs> I did not, yeah, I did not like that. Yeah, it was pretty horrifying. That was hor horrifying. <laughs> it's like a perfect word. Yeah. The only it. reason I played that too is because literally like three minutes before I played that, you said that if you were going to go out, you would want to be eaten by a grizzly bear. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and you were just I like, was like, I don't know if you would no, want you that. you wouldn't. <laughs> you were like, no, you wouldn't, buddy. <laughs> Because you can just tell that guy is like not having a good time. Here I have Placidon shermani, or the red-legged salamander. And this is what that Desmognathus that we saw with the red legs earlier was imitating. And you can see that the legs on this are pretty red compared to the one that I figured as a hybrid earlier. And this one... Maybe a hybrid as well, but it has more of the red-legged trait. Here's another Puthodon shermani, or the red-legged salamander. Y'all can see those legs on this guy are very red in color, and that's how it gets its common name. This here is another Puthodon shermani, or possible shermani hybrid, but the legs on this individual are very red. Here is a female red-legged salamander, or Puthodon shermani. Here's another shermani. This here is a Blue Ridge two-line salamander. And this one differs from the southern two-line salamander that we saw earlier because First of all, the color is a bit different. This is a little bit more brighter, more vibrant. And on the tail of this one, the line stops at about the legs length right there. And on the, the southern two line, the stripe goes all the way to the tip of the tail. This is my first Blue Ridge two line salamander. So I'm pretty excited right now. My buddy Chris actually uncovered this one and uh, I didn't find it myself, but. This looks like it may be a pure Southern Appalachian Mountain Salamander or Southern Appalachian Salamander, whichever one it is. And I'm getting that because there's no red on the legs and there's all those white specks all over the body. Here is another Blue Ridge two-line salamander. They seem to be pretty common at this area. And I haven't said this yet, but the scientific name on this species is Euricea wilderae.
Ron and I are heading back to the parking lot where our car is parked this morning. And then we're heading to the Okefenokee Swamp in Georgia. And this is on the southern end of Georgia. Right now we're in the mountains on the southern end of the Nantahala National Forest in North Carolina on the border of Georgia. So we basically are traveling the entire state of Georgia this morning and this afternoon. So I'm sure that we're going to end up seeing something cool on the way and I'll start filming once we do. Ron and I have made it to Georgia and we're completely out of the mountains now. We've been driving for quite a few hours and we're almost at the Okefenokee Swamp, which if y'all haven't heard of it before, it's on the border of Southern Georgia and Northern Florida. And I have no real goals except for to see an alligator, but what I've heard, that's definitely going to happen. So I kind of want to just do some exploring around with the kayak and see what we can find. And I'm just gonna film whatever I see that I think is worth putting in the video. So I hope you all enjoy. Ron and I are here at the Stephen C. Foster State Park in southern Georgia and we're about to do a little bit exploring in the Okefenokee Wildlife Refuge where this park is located but right now we got our hammock set up for the night and uh, then I'm gonna do a little more con or kayaking in the morning and then uh, we'll be headed off to South Carolina. Come on bud! Ron and I are walking the nature trail at the Stephen C. Foster State Park, and I've noticed a lot of the Spanish moss, which is a very common species of plant here in the Southeast United States, especially in South Carolina and Georgia. And this is actually a species of bromeliad, and that means that it's in the same family as pineapple. But it's not actually a moss at all. It's a type of plant. So there are three types of wetlands that I believe y'all should know how to classify. And I'm just gonna go big to small going by the type of plant that dominates these three species of wetlands. Number one is the bog, which is a body of water dominated by moss. And usually it's sphagnum moss. And then next up is a marsh, a body of water dominated by grass. And lastly, you have the type of wetland that Ron and I are experiencing right now, which is the swamp, which is a body of water that's dominated by trees. Here we can see three cypress trees and they're a type of coniferous tree that lives in the water in swamps and they're typically seen covered in Spanish moss. There's a couple more right here. They grow fairly tall and their bark can be easily identified because it has long lengthy strips that are pretty flaky. Here we have a small cottonmouth on the side of the road in Okefenokee National Wildlife Refuge. And it was just showing its uh, defense a second ago, how it was opening up its mouth to show that it's white on the inside to warn me that it's venomous. 
but I'm staying far enough away that the snake can't harm me. So I'm gonna let it be, but I just wanted to show this neat snake that's on the side of the road here. Here we got some cypress knees, along with a few actual cypress trees. But right here are the cypress knees, and the actual purpose, I believe, is unknown for these structures, but I think what they've settled on so far is that they're probably to get air to the trunk of the plant and to the roots, uh, just like an extra structure to bring extra air and possibly uh, moisture to the main trunk of the plant all right so this is a really really neat national wildlife refuge here I'm really enjoying my time in the Okefenokee swamp and uh, I've seen many gators already that was uh, basically my one goal for the trip so I found an enormous patch of utricularia here and I'm not sure what species this is, but this is a species of carnivorous plant. And they hunt with these little bladders that are underneath the water. And they expand and capture little microscopic, uh, microscopic invertebrates from out of the water. But it's not showing up too well on the camera, but this species has a really pretty purple flower that sticks above the water. But this is just an enormous patch of them. There's a rowdy boy. Here we have some netted chain fern. And this species is very similar to the sensitive fern. However, there are two small differences. And one is that the outside of the frond and the pinnae on this fern here are little tiny teeth and on the sensitive fern it's smooth and the other difference is that the sensitive fern is opposite mostly on its pinnae across the rachis now the netted chain fern here is alternate so you can see that it has a pinnae and then another one climbing up like a ladder so it's like one, then another one, then another one, diagonally across the rakes. Man, that was super, super cool. There was a ton of alligators all over the swamp. Uh, sadly, I wasn't able to really film them very much because uh, they're just very difficult to get close to to film like literally like 20 yards out they go under the water when you're when you get that close to them so there's really no film in any gators there was there's a little clip that I'll throw in um, other than that I saw a ton of bigger birds and I saw a absolute ton of spiders there was these big spiders I couldn't really get them to show up on film either though but uh, they were stretched across the little creek that we were kayaking on in the swamp. And it was just crazy. But that was a really neat place. I'd like to go back there one time. But now, Ron and I are on our way to Congaree, South Carolina. 
and we're gonna be doing a little bit of backpacking tonight and we're gonna camp out there and then uh, something new in the morning tomorrow. But Here is a common snapping turtle that is currently trying to cross the road and I'm going to help this little guy get across and I wanted to show y'all when you do this that you're supposed to put the turtle in the direction that they were heading. So this turtle is facing this way so I'm gonna put it over here. Instead of putting it that way on the other side, which would mean that the turtle would actually just go back into the road again so they could get where it was going. So you just wanna be mindful of the direction that you're helping the turtle across the road in because you could actually be putting it in more danger by accident, so. <laughs> Ron and I have arrived at Congaree National Park and we are going to be hiking through the park a little bit and showing you all the amazing trees that live here and hopefully a few salamanders. But here is the uh, outside of the visitor center so you can take a look. The Harry Hampton Visitor Center with the National Park Service sign. As you all can see the trail here is very sandy. That's because we are part of the Sand Hill region of South Carolina right now, and it is named so well. That's because most of the soil around this area is covered in sand. So Congaree is a really underrated national park. Uh, I mentioned it a couple times that it's like the least visited national park in the U.S. But it is this ginormous, uh, what uh, people would call at first glance a swamp, but it's actually a floodplain because the entire park gets flooded with water in the winter and spring. And in the summer and fall, it dries up. So you're able to hike and backpack through it in the summer. And then in the winter and the wet season, you can actually kayak over top of where you went hiking before when it was the dry season. But it's just a really, really neat environment. I'm on the boardwalk trail right now so that we can get back to the wilderness where camping is permitted. If y'all know anything about Loblolly Ponds, you know that this one is very large. There it is down to the bottom. And it just goes up and up and up till you get to the very top. The trees here are gargantuan. Here is the species that I was in search of at Congaree National Park. And this is known as Euricea guda lineata or the three-lined salamander. Now this is in the same genus as the two line salamanders, like the southern and the blue ridge that we saw on this trip already. But these have a beautiful white on black on their belly and they're just a pretty common salamander that you can find at the state, um, not state, but national park.
a pretty darn big pine tree here. This is a Loblolly pine or Pinus taita. Very big one. This may actually be the biggest one in the world. Um, I know that tree exists in this park. I'm not entirely sure which exact tree it is, but I do believe that it is actually this tree. So, pretty cool stuff. Well, it started raining on us here. We're still hiking to our campsite. We haven't made it to the wilderness yet, which is where you're required to set up camp if you do. So first we need to get to the wilderness area and then we'll set up and then we're gonna turn in early for bed since it's storming. But uh, it's funny because the last time I came to Backpack Congaree, the same exact thing happened the day that we got here. It started uh, raining like crazy. So here we are. You're a good boy. Have your dinner. It's dinner time for Roni Baloney here. If y'all were wondering why he didn't eat, it's because I trained him to uh, wait to eat until I give him the go-ahead. Just especially since he was a dog that I found outside when I originally got him, I just wanted to train him on his food very well so that I'm able to mess with his food and control when he gets his food and everything just so he never gets aggressive about it. As you can see, he's totally fine with me. Just sticking my hand in there and messing with him. He doesn't care at all, which is what you want. Is it yummy, Bubba? I just wanted to show this on the camera and it makes it look kind of blurry, but uh, this is one of the trail markers here at Congaree and it glows when you shine light on it. It's like a reflective material that you would see on the back of a bike or whatever. And it's nice because it allows you to night hike. And the time is now 5.40 a.m. It helps to be able to hike out in the morning before the light even hits. And it's also nice here, especially at Congaree, because it's such a hot and humid park that when you're on a backpacking trip, you usually want to be done hiking by 11 a.m. or 12 p.m. And uh, if you're able to start when it's still dark out, then that's great. Well, we're still driving to uh, Clifton Forge, Virginia, and we are going to be looking for Plethodon whirlii, or the, the whirls salamander when we get there. And it is raining like the Dickens right now, so it looks like great salamander weather. Uh, this is a species that has eluded me for years, and they're not very colorful or anything. It's just that I want to see this species, and I'm hoping that Today is finally the day. So when we get to the area that we're gonna hike around and search for these salamanders, I'll let y'all know, but it has been raining all morning and it looks like it's supposed to be raining when we get there as well. So looks like good luck for salamanders. As you can see, Ron and I stopped in Roanoke to get some Scratch Biscuit Company. And this time I decided to try their fried green tomato biscuit with uh, bacon on it. So there's some bacon, fried green tomato. Should be pretty, uh, pretty good. They have really good hot sauce at this place too. So got some of that to put on top. But I'm gonna enjoy this and then we'll be on our way to Clifton Forge where we're hopefully gonna find the world salamander. So I had to show a view of all these maidenhair ferns because I've never seen this many clumped together before. They're all over the side of this little hike that I'm doing. They're pretty neat looking. Here is a Nodophthalmus viridescens eft or the Eastern Newt eft or the Red Spotted Newt or the just easier term Red eft. This is the juvenile form 
of what's most commonly known as the Eastern Newt. And I've talked about these in videos before, so I won't go into too much detail, but very awesome species. Wanted to show y'all a view of the mountains peeking through there. Well, Ron and I are definitely done searching at this mountain, at least at the top. We uh, hiked all the way to the peak and there wasn't a very good view. And the problem is, I'm pretty sure that I found a juvenile whorls salamander, but I didn't take the video out because I was like, ah. If I find one, I'll definitely find more. And I can't tell you how many times I've done that and been taught that lesson over and over and over again. So I'm definitely gonna be searching a little more where I found that one once I get down to almost the bottom where it actually was, but it's not looking good for the world salamander once again. So I'm not gonna call it complete quits yet, but it's, it's definitely not looking good right now. Here's a species of fern that I haven't showed yet on the channel. And uh, it's a species of wood fern and it's pretty easy to identify. You just have to notice first that it's a wood fern by the way that it grows and it has a circular rosette and everything. And then you look closely and the pinnae are not spiky like the other wood ferns are. And then Flip it over and take a look and you'll notice that the sori or the spores are on the margins of the pinnae. So that's why it's called the marginal wood fern. I just spotted this small Lithobates sylvaticus or wood frog. This is a rather common found frog in the eastern United States and it can be identified by that tan color with that black raccoon mask on the face. And they're pretty interesting Lithobates species because they spend a lot of time away from water. Whereas most of the other Lithobates like the American bullfrog or the green frog spend most of their time right in the water or next to it. Well, no world salamander today, but that's okay. I'm not too good at finding those salamanders apparently, uh, but I'll tell you one thing that I am good at is hitting spider webs with my face. Oh, there was literally one every five yards, 10 yards on that trail. It was crazy, but uh, I just pushed through it. That's okay. It's kind of nice sometimes to uh, head down a trail that's not as uh, easy as the Appalachian Trail. And I know a lot of people are gonna be like, what, the Appalachian Trail is hard when I say that, but it's, it's not, that the Appalachian Trail isn't difficult physically, it's just that the extra things are not really a factor there. Like, it's well kept. So you have like a lot of uh, nice trails. There's not a lot of brush you have to like bushwhack through. And usually there's a lot more people, so there's no spider webs in the middle of the trail, unless you're the first one out in the morning. But uh, I was the first one on that trail in a while because spiders got me today, but. No bites, I don't think. So, on to the next spot. Well, that was 
definitely an awesome trip. Uh, we saw a collection of different environments going from the mountains to the swamps in the low country back to the mountains again and we saw all different species of uh, salamander from the different kinds of areas that they live in and overall that was just a great trip. I'm glad that I got to see those different environments all in the same span of a week. Like going from a really high mountain summit to a Georgia swamp full of gators in one day is a pretty awesome transition and I just have so many places that I want to go back to and I'm going to keep making these videos for you guys so stay tuned for more and until next time peace